Hi, it's clear to me that from comments people have been making on my last video that I need to produce some material on financial crises so that people have a better understanding of the market. The key to this is to understand what Marx meant by profit of enterprise and the difference between the ordinary rate of profit and the and what he calls the rate of profit of enterprise. And this is covered in volume three of Capital, but it's sections that people probably don't always pay that much attention to. So I'm going to explain methods of calculating the rate of profit, give you the formula for a profit of enterprise, show why this leads to instability and how this interacts with the interest rate. Anyone who's read a little Marxian economics knows the basic formula for the rate of profit. It is P prime equals S over C plus V, which gives the flow rate of profit. Here C means the constant capital purchased in the year period and V the variable capital purchased in the same year and s is the rate of surplus s is the surplus value but this simple formula ignores the fixed capital that was already present at the start of the year and it also ignores stocks of inputs and work in progress that the firm has so a proper formula for the stock rate of profit is that p sub s is equal to surplus value over big K, where big K is the stock of fixed capital plus stock of raw materials and work in progress plus an addition for wages. The addition for wages should really be V times T, whereas, where T is the turnover period in years of the variable capital. If wages are paid monthly, T is one over 12 which is 0 0.083. So you can usually ignore the term for wages. It makes a very negligible difference to the total capital stock. So that's the basic rate of profit. Now look at profit of enterprise. Firms typically borrow money from banks and the profit available for their shareholders is less than the gross rate of profit. It's what's left over after paying interest. And Marx defines profit of enterprise as surplus value minus interest. The interest payments themselves are going to be equal to the quantity of loans the firm has times the rate of interest. So a rise in the rate of interest will reduce the profits of enterprise. It reduces what goes to shareholders and a, a larger part of the profit goes to banks. Next thing you have to grasp is the notion of a gearing ratio. The gearing ratio refers to the share of total capital that a firm employs, which it has obtained from the banks. That's to say, the share of the capital that is notionally owned by the bank run by the shareholders. So if half the a firm's employed capital was funded by bank loans, we would say the gearing ratio was 0 0.5. If you've got the gearing ratio, you can compute the profit rate of profit of enterprise, which I'm going to write as E prime. So the rate of profit of enterprise is the stock rate of profit minus G times the rate of interest over 1 minus g. Now that looks rather complicated formula so I'll explain it. The divisor 1 minus g is there because the shareholders are only interested in the rate of profit on their equity capital. If the gearing ratio was 70 percent for example their equity, equity capital will only be 30 percent of the total co capital. So they will calculate the, the, the profit that goes to them on that capital of their own. The numerator P minus GR 
is there because of the effective rate of profit will depend on the portion of total profit left after interest. The interest paid will be proportional to the gearing. The higher the gearing, the higher the rate, the level of interest paid, and it will be proportional to the interest rate. So the effective rate of return on the total capital is the original rate of return, PS, minus G times R. And this then gives you what appears to be the rate of return to the shareholders. Now let's see why this leads to instability. If you plot enterprise profit as a function of the gearing ratio, you get a curve. Let's assume the rate of profit on total capital is 7% and the interest rate is 5%. We see that if the firm borrows nothing, its rate of profit to the shareholders is 7%. But as it increases its borrowing from the banks, the apparent rate of profit to the shareholders can go up to 15% when 80% of the capital has been borrowed from the banks. So there is a high incentive to borrow from the banks if your rate of profit is above the rate of interest because shareholders experience a sh sharply rising rate of profit as the gearing ratio is increased. On the other hand, if the interest rate rose to 8% instead of 5%, what you find is that the if the firm borrows nothing, it is making 7%. But as its borrowing increases, its profitability falls sharply and it ends up making a loss. If it, if it borrows 95% or just over 90% of its capital from the banks, it'll be making minus 5% profit. So completely different outcomes according to whether the rate of interest is above or below the current rate of profit. You can plot this as a two-dimensional curve here where we assume the rate of the rate of profit is 7%. The gearing ratio is along the x-axis here. The rate of interest along the y-axis and the rate of profit of enterprise on the z-axis. And you get this curved surface which is high when the interest rate is low and low and negative when the interest rate is high. Now this is an inherently unstable situation. Firms which have invested using bank funds during a period of low interest can be faced with difficulties when the interest rate rises. If they have a low gearing ratio, they can generally afford to pay the, back the loans. But once their gearing ratio is past a certain critical level, they are actually forced to borrow more to cover current expenditure. And they get further and further into debt and eventually fail. So, what determines the interest rate in this picture? If a bank extends an overdraft facility to Company A, then as soon as Company A buys supplies from Companies B, C and D, the credit balances of these firms increase. The Company A writes them a cheque. The Company B, C and D, when they get the cheques, they pay them into the bank their credit balances go up and the debit balance of A goes up. So A appears as a debtor to the bank and B, C and D become um, creditors of the bank. And these credit balances of B, C and D become liabilities of the banking system. To balance these liabilities, the banks have to have assets. They, they have the balances of B, C and D have to equal the loan to A and other borrowers plus the cash reserves. But loans to borrowers like A are hard to call in. Whereas B, C and D, if they've got 
deposits with the bank can withdraw their money on demand. And the bank can only count on its cash reserves at short notice. So the cost to, of making a loan to a bank is set by the risk that they may not have enough cash to meet customer withdrawals. And if that happens, they're forced to borrow on the money market to cover their from other banks to cover their short term liabilities. So if they, their reserve ratio falls, this risk rises. And to compensate for that, they have to charge more interest on any loans they make. So you have a financial cycle. And this is typical of the capitalist system, it runs through this cycle every five to 10 years, or seven to 10 years. Start off with low interest rates. Firms borrow to cover investment. As a result of them making purchases, deposits with the banks rise. The effect of that is that the reserve ratio of the banking system falls and the banks raise the rate of interest. Some firms then find they're in a debt trap. Uh, the banks realise they have non-performing performing loans and you classically would get a financial crisis here. Some of the banks might actually fail because of that. After the recession that follows, there's less economic activity, deposits with the banks decline, the reserve ratios of the banks improve and they end up reducing their interest rate and the system restarts again. Um, in the classical system analysed by Marx, the reserve ratio is set by the actual amount of gold that is available to be at the monetary base of the banks. In a modern system, it's set by the amount of state money that is issued. Because state money can in principle just be printed, it is possible for central banks now to offset financial crises in a way that wasn't possible in the 19th century when Marx was analysing a system based on the gold standard. But if you are looking at the history of the 1930s, which is relevant to the last video I had, the monetary system was still precious metal based and the limiting factor was the amount of gold or silver that provided the monetary base of the banks. And the banks were legally obliged to be able to um, yield currency that was exchangeable for gold. So you had a very tight restriction on the reserves. Unless the, the countries went off the gold standard, as some of them did in the 30s, it was very difficult to get out of that kind of financial crisis because once the ratio of bank deposits to gold rises above a certain critical level, the risk to the banks of making further loans becomes very expensive, interest rates rise, the willingness of banks to make loans declines, and banks try and pull in their loans. And all of that happened in the early 30s. So, what you should take away from this is that there are more explanations to economic crises than simply ones based on the simple theory of profit. You have to take into account the financial system as well.